Kia ora e Fano. Hey, it is so good to have you join us today. Very soon we're going to hear from one of our team, but before we do, we're going to have some worship. Yeah, let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for all that you're doing in our church. We adore you, we love you, and we're here to lift you up. Let's worship.
Kia ora whānau, mōrena, ko Ben toko ingoa, ko McGregor toko ingoa whānau, uh, my name's Ben McGregor, uh, ko Anna Grace toku hine, tino atahoa o te aukatoa, I've got the most beautiful wife in the world, and uh, just because this is going on shine, nā mihi tenei um, ki, to, uh, ki toku uh, kuia, hi granny, I love you, from your favourite grandchild. Um, guys, it is such a blessing to be with you this morning, and I'm really celebrating because last week we had 23 baptisms. Isn't that awesome across all of our services? Yeah, let's give a clap for that. And um, we've actually got three more today as well, and I'm so excited by that because um, over uh, around half of them have been kids under 18, and man, God is doing the most incredible thing through our kids. And um, I just want to say from... Uh, my heart as a kids pastor the last eight years, I'm just so honoured to lead your kids. So thank you. Thank you for letting me love your kids. Thank you for the privilege it is of hyping them up on sugar and then passing them back to you. And um, But thank you for the miracles we've been able to see as well. We've seen uh, kids just get completely healed. And a kids service, uh, we prayed for eyesight and a little girl got completely healed. She went back to the doctors and they said, um, you don't need glasses anymore, you're completely healed. We've seen kids that have walked in on crutches and the kids have prayed for them and they get completely healed and they walk out without the crutches and they go back to see different scans and everything and everything's completely fine. So God's doing the most incredible things. We're seeing uh, kids bring their friends from school and their friends encounter Jesus and then bring their whole family along to church. And I just want to say, um, sometimes I say to the kids that I, we leave the adults here in adult crash while the kids do the real stuff. <laughs> Because God is doing the most incredible stuff in the kids. And I just want to encourage you, keep bringing along your kids because there is something that we get to see of so much life as they grow through the church to be able to see even greater fruit. And it's such a privilege to do this together. And uh, I'm saying that because I grew up in this church. For those of you that didn't know me, um, I'm a pastor's kid, yo. And um, my parents, uh, Dave and Lizzie McGregor, planted this church when I was four years old. So I've grown up and I've seen a lot of things. And I used to feel like I ran the roost as well because um, my parents were in charge of this, but I could kind of tell my parents what to do as well. No, I'm just kidding. But um, I, I just felt like I was the boss of this place because it was like my second home. And um, I got into a little bit of trouble growing up. And in fact, there's some of my uh, kids leaders here from back then. And uh, I just want to say thank you for believing in me. Miracles are true. I'm standing here today because <laughs> I was a little punk. Me and one of my other brothers, who I won't name because that's unfair on Josh. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, there's a few vivid memories that I have grown up here in church. One of them was um, we used to always get fed in kids' church and then afterwards they'd have all these amazing biscuits from Coupland's out. And um, it, it had a sign that said adults only. I don't know why they put that sign there. I don't know what made them do that. But um, I went up and I looked at the lady in the eye and just smiled and grabbed five cookies in my hand and just um, started eating them. And then she comes over and says, excuse me, what do you think you're doing? And I said to her, excuse me, do you know who I am? Do you know who my dad is? And I got in massive trouble after that. <laughs> my dad told me off. But um, I used to just think I was a punk. Another uh, memory that I have is actually being up here and... Um, you know, when you're learning uh, just the different dynamics of worship as well, you start out like everyone's lifting their hands and you put your hand out like that. And then suddenly it starts to raise up more. And then uh, there was this one Sunday where I was like, I'm just going to be the handiest guy out there and just put it straight up and straight down. And so we were singing Blessed Be Your Name. And... Um, that I, I put my hand up for a second and then quickly put it down. And out of nowhere, this guy that must have been high or drunk or something, he ran from the back and started um, shouting. And he came up the front and grabbed one of the microphones and went, ah! And then six of these guys just come, that was security, and they grab him off the stage and pull him back down. And everyone's a bit freaked. And then they keep singing, bless him be the name of the Lord. And I was like, wow. This is better than the movies. This is the power of raising your hands. So it was pretty encouraging for me. Um, but one of the most vivid memories that I have as well is being baptised here. And um, I was 12 years old when I got baptised. And it was a beautiful thing for me just being able to make that step of faith. But uh, a lot of people say that when you're in the water and you come out, you're like a different person, you know. Uh, like I could, I could come out like Brad Pitt, you know. Like um, I didn't quite know what was going to happen. But I went under and I came out and heaps of people were saying, do you feel any different? And I said, to be honest, I feel wet. And um, 
I, I didn't really feel much different in my heart, but I realised that I was making a public decision from a private decision that I'd made long ago, and I'd chosen to say yes to God. And I've uh, called this talk, I've Decided Today, because uh, I want us to know just firstly what we decide as Christians. And there's three things I want to touch on, on some of the things that all of us are still on a journey for, for these three things, but we've decided them in our hearts. But yet, before I even go there, I just want to say one thing, Jesus has already decided you. Jesus has already decided you and He's not going to back down on that decision. He doesn't change. He doesn't go back and forth like we sometimes do at McDonald's in the drive through He has fully already made His mind up about you and He loves you. And so that's where I want to start from, that Jesus has already decided you. And it's our response on how we know what we're going to decide as well in response to that love, in response to the revelation of God's love. And one of the stories that um, I remember my dad sharing a lot of the time during baptisms was the prodigal son. And you've probably all heard it. It's in Matthew 15. And it says this. This is a different Bible than what I was using in the first service. No, it's not. I'm just in Matthew. That's why it's different. Uh, in uh, Luke 15, it says uh, that Jesus was hanging out with the sinners and tax collectors, the people that were on the outskirts during that time. And uh, the Pharisees were very disappointed in him. And they said, do you know who you're hanging out with? And Jesus responded with these stories, first about the lost sheep, then the lost coin, and finally this one in verse 11. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, forgive, uh, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the youngest son got together all he had, set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth and wild living. He probably stole a few bickies in his day as well. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So there's a father that loves the son so much, but yet love can't ever force someone to stay. Love always gives a choice. And so the father gives his son the choice and the son goes off and does his own thing. And he, it says there's wild living. And I just want to put this in context as well, because when we hear about the pigs, we think that's just gross in general, but it was even more gross and disrespectful and actually one of the most shameful things that you could do in the Jewish culture because pigs were seen as unclean. And so not only was he taking that job and it was disgusting, but it was actually bringing shame to his whole family that he would be associated with that. And so here he is in that most uh, uh, awful and down spot that he could ever get in. And it says this, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. And I just want to make a point on that, that there might be some people here that are still praying for people that are lost to come home. And you're praying and it seems like they're getting in more desperate situations. Notice here that his desperation led to revelation. And I want to say to you right now, for those that are praying for loved ones that haven't come to know Jesus, don't be worried when there's desperation because God allows our desperation to lead to revelation. And so no matter what situation, or even if you're here, maybe you're in a desperate situation, God's going to give you revelation today. He's wanting to open your eyes. So it says, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. So he, uh, the son just thought he was going to be kicked out of the family, but little did he know his dad was waiting for him. And he runs to him with his arms wide open. And in those days, you need to understand as well, running was seen as something as of a shameful thing uh, for a, a person of authority like this person in the Bible, because uh, you would have a long robe. And so if you ran, it might show some nudity. And yet the father was not worried about that because he has his eyes on one thing, his son. And he runs to him with his arms open and embraces him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. 
But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the cat and, uh, fa- bring the cat and faff. <laughs> bring the fat and calf. Sorry, I'm getting my words waddled. And kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And this is the most beautiful picture of actually this realisation that the son has that nothing he could do could make the father love him any more or any less. My first point today, I have decided grace. And that's a big word. We say it a lot in church culture. C.S. Lewis walked into a room with a whole bunch of theologians and they were discussing what's the difference between Christianity and other religions. And C.S. Lewis said, that's easy, it's grace. Yeah, that's easy, you know? All the other guys must have been sitting there like, yeah, see, Uh, CS, I don't know what you call him for a nickname. Uh, uh, Yeah, see, yeah, yeah, grace. And I'd be like that as well because I've grown up my whole life hearing about grace and even saying, talking about grace, I... And from Grace Vineyard, and yet I haven't really caught that revelation for a lot of my life. And grace is the unmerited favour of God. It's that He loves us because He loves us because He loves us. There's no rhythm or rhyme or reason to exactly why He loves us. He just simply does. And His love for us isn't based on who you are, it's based on who He is which is a good thing because that means His love never changes for us. And it's meaning no matter what we've done, it couldn't make Him love us any more, but also what we've done couldn't make Him close the door. It's saying that in the midst of everything in life, He is always inviting us with open arms. But a revelation of His grace always leads to going closer to God. It never leaves us further from God. And that's the thing that I want us to catch on to today, a revelation of God's grace for us. And I've spent so long trying to wrestle with this because um, I love to just say that that story in Luke 15 ended there. And I'd I'd be happy with that. You know, I'd be like, that's sweet, man. Yeah, that's great. But um, it it doesn't end there. And there's another bit to the story because there's an older son. There's an older brother and for so much of my Christian life, I've loved that first bit and gotten so annoyed with that last bit. I've gotten so offended with that last bit because I know that last bit is me, the older son. And I've tried to earn God's approval. I've tried to be within his house. I just wanna give you a picture of God's grace of what happened for my life and the definition of it for me. And um, the way I wanna illustrate that is through a beautiful man uh, that I get to call my granddad. So this is Jim Miller, and uh, he was the most incredible man that just absolutely loved God. And um, when I uh, was in this church, I would kind of stay away from anyone that looked a little bit dodgy when I was a kid, you know. In fact, um, one person used to smoke outside the church, and I would always try and run past them the long way just in case they tried to set me on fire. I had that in my head, and I was like, sheesh, I'm going to stay away. And Granddad would go down to the square every Friday night, for 25 years, and he would feed all the homeless and the drug addicts and the glue sniffers and the poor and those that were on the fringes of society. And he would love them and people were just weeping and they were drunk and they were just weeping in his arms and I would watch the way Granddad loved them. He would be kind to them. And in fact, uh, some of my incredible friends that I met are still here today because of what Jesus did through Granddad. And my eyes were completely opened because I was like, these are the people that don't deserve God's love, you know? They haven't done anything to deserve that. And I've been picking up rubbish around my school. And, um, and I was just thinking, this isn't right. Like, is this legal to love people like this? And yet I realised that that is the very heart of Jesus, to love people no matter where they're from. And that was grace. And so I was driving home with Granddad one day after going to the square And um, just got to say, he was the worst driver in the world as well. Um, He would go about 100k down a 50k zone. uh, And then he would go about 30k down a 100k zone. You never quite knew what was going to happen. In fact, one time we were going home that night and he was going 30k down a 100k zone, but we were early. And I was like, Granddad, you can speed up. And he said, yeah, but we're not in any hurry. And so he's just literally going 30K and we've got about 10 cars beeping behind us and I'm just slowly going down in my seat. And he pulls over to the side and there's this old house that's fully run down. And Granddad said, oh, I've just got to make uh, one more drop off for some extra sausages I've got. And so uh, I said, okay, that's a bit weird. And Granddad said, you come in. I was like, is Granddad wanting me to die? And um, 
So I follow Granddad and he opens the door to this house and I couldn't believe my eyes. There was a man in the corner just crying and the house smelled of glue. He was a glue sniffer and the whole house just completely stunk. And this man was crying and crying and I recognised him. It was the exact same man that ran up the front shouting all those years before and ran to the back and got taken out. And I was like, wow, Granddad doesn't love me. He wants me to die in this place. And I was freaked out for my life. But granddad went over to this man and this man was crying and crying. And he said, nobody loves me. Nobody cares for me. And granddad, I just remember this picture of granddad with his arms right around him. And this man stunk like he probably never had a shower in his life. And granddad said, well, I love you. And you know that Jesus loves you too. And that was a picture that I will never forget of God's grace that actually all of us stink. And yet God runs to us with open arms and he's embracing us and reminding us that we're his. And for me as the older son, it seems unfair because I was trying to earn God's love. In fact, Luke 15, verse 28 to 29, the older son became angry. This is after he had celebration and he stood outside. He refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. Do you know what I love is that God gives the exact same love to the younger son and to the older son. He still comes out. If it was me, I'd be like, oh, come on. I would slap the older son on the head. Come on, get in there. Come on, celebrate your brother. Grow some respect. Hug him. No, really hug him. No, put your arms around him. Oh no, that's disgusting. You know, I would have been like, like just so annoyed with his behaviour, yet God shows the exact same grace to the older son. And he comes out with his arms wide open as well. And um, he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never obeyed, disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a goat so I could celebrate with my friends. And this guy, uh, I can relate so much to because I have spent so much of my life trying to earn God's love. It's nearly like one of those kids that just keeps going to the camera when they're trying to film someone else. Hey, look at me, look at me. And I was trying to earn God's approval. I, was, I actually would lead people, more people to Jesus simply because I wanted God to see me and say, are you pleased with me? And I would, I would be crying out from my heart. And yet it was in a crazy desperate situation for me when I broke my leg and I was believing in full healing. I, I prayed for it in the name of Jesus and nothing happened. So then I prayed for it in the name of Jesus and nothing happened. But then I prayed for it in the name of Jesus and still nothing happened. And I was like, this is ridiculous. And I had surgery on my leg and I sat there for 10 weeks all by myself. And God spoke to me. And when I hear God speak, it's not an audible voice, it's in my heart. And He said, this is how I love you, just being you. He just wanted me to come with nothing. And that was the very thing that I didn't know how to do, to just do nothing, just to be with Him. And just like the older son, I feel like some of us have been around the Lord's house for so long and yet we haven't known what it is to just simply be with Him. And God has His arms wide open. In fact, the same God in that story of the Father with His arms open is the same God of Jesus that died on the cross for us with His arms wide open to say, this is how much I love you. Where in our generation today, there's um, a lot of people self-harming to question their worth. Jesus holds the scars that prove our worth. And Jesus is saying today that He still has His arms wide open for every single one of you. But I also realised that because I was thinking that God was a taskmaster, I couldn't come to Him in any state. And so I had to have a revelation of God's grace. I also decided weakness. I also realised I had to come weak before God. There's a beautiful um, cheesy poet that wrote, seven days without Jesus makes one week. That was clever. And um, I actually had a, a, I was ministering to someone on the street one time and uh, they said to me, oh, you're a Christian, aren't you? And he said, do you know, I think Christians are just people that are so weak that they decide that they need a saviour because they can't do it by themselves. And do you know what I said? I said, you're exactly right. You just shared the gospel. And that's the whole thing. We need to decide to come weak 
That was the thing that the prodigal son had. He came as he was, weak, with nothing to offer. And yet the son thought he had a great resume of slaving away and helping him. And yet he didn't come to him with his weakness. And I had to go on this massive journey for myself because I've always wanted to show my strengths. And I have incredible strengths as well. I'm really good at playing the triangle. Um, In the football, I was an incredible water boy for our team as well. I'd always run on at the right times. And I always thought, man, God, like, don't you see my strengths? And, and yet it was during one of the hardest times of my life last year that I felt so weak. And it was like this where my little daughter, Thea, was just about to be born. And just before she was born, um, my brother moved over to the USA, which isn't um, a bad thing. That was beautiful. Met the girl of his dreams. But his wedding ended up being the day before Thea was born. We were in hospital and it was just such a big grief for us not being there. But then um, four days earlier, my papa had died. He went to be with Jesus. And then uh, three weeks earlier, my grandma on my mum's side died and she went to be with Jesus. And so I just thought, oh, as soon as this baby comes, I'm just, it's going to be happy, joyful and strong. And the, um, the birth was actually uh, quite traumatic and um, her heart rate went down. There was a whole lot of things that went wrong. But uh, she came out safely and I thought everything would be fine. But I, I started to become really weak and I started to think maybe I'm losing the plot. Maybe I'm getting depression or anxiety. I went to a counsellor, an incredible counsellor from this church who just was, showed me Jesus and he just wept with me. And the whole time, and as we wept and I shared my story, he made me realise that I wasn't just anxious, which I was, and uh, feeling depressed and burnt out, but I was actually grieving my sister who died when I was six years old, and I was grieving her 20 years later when my little girl was born because I realised what my parents went through. And so I just had this massive... Uh, unloading of grief and uh, my heart just felt so empty and I said to God, God, I can't take anymore. I feel so weak. And um, about a week after I prayed that, my granddad went to be with Jesus as well. And so I was, um, I lost three grandparents that year and I was just feeling so down and I realised that my my quiet time with Jesus uh, became less and less because I was hiding from God. And I felt God say to me, why, do you, why are you hiding from me? And I said, because I, I don't have any strength left. I can't come to you. And he said, but I want you to come weak. I love you when you're weak. And I, I realised that actually I'd been hiding my heart for so long from God because I was too afraid for Him to come into my weakness. And yet there was the very place God wanted to come into and bring healing. In fact, I was holding Thea one day and she was screaming her eyes out. She'd just done a punami. Um, all the dads in the house say, amen, brother. And um, she had just got poos everywhere on her. And I was holding this little baby and I was just rocking her. And I felt God say, do you love her any less because she's just done a punami? And uh, I said, no, no. And uh, he said, what about because she's so weak and she's so helpless? And I said, no way. And he said, then why do you think I would think any different of you? And I was like, oh. <laughs> and he said, I just want you to come to me weak. And every day I've been singing before Thea was born until today, I've been singing over her, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong, they are weak, but He is strong. And I realised that God had put that on my heart because I actually had to sing it over myself again. I had to come to Him weak. I realised that if I couldn't come to God weak, then I actually couldn't come to the cross. Because what we're acknowledging is that we don't need the cross because we're strong by ourselves. And that is the very place we need to come. Jesus came and died on the cross because of our weakness, because of us trying to do life by ourselves. And so He's inviting us all like the oldest son to come to the cross, to come weak. Paul in the Bible knows this more than anyone else. He had been through so many things. He got stoned twice. He, um, the the throwing stones at, by the way. And um, then he had been tried to be killed. He had been shipwrecked. He had been in prison. And while he was in prison, he was going through this real hard thing. We don't actually know exactly what it was, but it says in 2 Corinthians 12 that God responds when Paul asks to take it away. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 
Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness and insults and hardships and persecution and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Man, that guy knew Jesus. When I am weak, then I am strong. Do you know, so often in the church, we see weakness as intimidation from the enemy. But what if we started to see weakness not as intimidation, but an invitation from God to come to Him? And we actually started to lay everything at His feet. We actually came just as we were. This is all I have to offer. And God says, that's exactly how I want you. Because if we can't let Him into our weakness, we're not actually giving God our full hearts and we're not fully trusting Him. And that's my final point. I have decided to trust. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. I love that hymn. And I've realised more and more, especially through all that I've been through, that there is no greater thing, there's no greater proof of my love to God than to trust Him. In fact, I, I believe that trust is the highest form of love that we can show. And I realised that last year when I was feeling so weak, God said to me this thing, He said, here on earth, there's one thing that you can give me that you can't give me when we're in heaven. And that's the gift of trust because we'll know everything. And there's one gift that He can give us here that we won't need in heaven and that's His grace to cover us in our weakness. Isn't that beautiful? And yet so often we find it so hard to trust God. We say, God, I give it to you. And yet, then um, we take it back. You know what I love about the altars in the Old Testament is that when someone would put something on the altar, what would they do after that? They would light it on fire, fire. (laughs) And as they lit it on fire, you can't, what happens when something's lit on fire? It burns. (laughs) You can't take it back. And yet so often what we do is we come to the altar and God say, God, I trust you. And then as soon as the fire's like, oh, better take that off. (laughs) That's my relationship. And then we try and take things into our own hands. But God is saying, can you trust me? Luke 15 verse 31, I love how the Father responds. My son, the Father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. Do you know God's wanting you to know today, especially if you've grown up in the church, you are always His. Everything He has is yours. And we can be around God's love so often, but not actually at home in His love. And God's wanting to invite us today, young and old, to actually be at home, to come home to Him. And I don't know about you, but I've dabbled between the prodigal son and the oldest son in my feelings of life. And wherever you're at today, God's inviting us to come. But I think I've grieved my heart and my heart so much because I've seen so many people give up on faith. I've had so many of my friends come through church with me being like, yeah, yeah, I'm going hard for God. I, yeah, I'm just gonna settle for nothing else of this world, but just be on fire for Him. And then a few weeks later, they die out in their faith. And it's broken my heart. And I've realised that all of us want a deep result of intimacy with Jesus. But we actually don't want to go through the journey of trust. And the journey of trust is painful. It's hard because it's constantly saying, God, I surrender to you. It's like learning the keys. Hands up who had to learn the piano here. Hands up if your parents made you learn the piano. You know? Yeah. My parents uh, said to me, oh, you'll thank us one day. Famous last words. I actually thank them a lot. But... um, Vi, do you want to just come up? Let's just give Vi a clap right now. Um, Vi is an incredible pianist. And actually, I've been so inspired to um, learn piano like him. But when I was seven years old, I, um, my parents made me go to piano. And I actually started to get a bit inspired because I heard someone playing Fur Elise. You know that song? Na, 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 na. Everyone knows it on the piano. And this guy was playing it amazing. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is incredible. So I went to my piano teacher and I was like, oh, okay, um, let's start playing Bach or one of those other wood creatures. And, um, and so I was getting ready to play a song and the, my piano teacher said, no, 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 you don't, you, we don't start with a, a song or a, a piece. We start with scales. I said, scales? Have you, who's heard a scale here before? This is what a scale sounds like. 
Mm. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Yeah, whoa. Mm, yeah. Who loves that? Who thinks that's beautiful? Yeah. I'll tell you what, we've got some albums outside after the service for scales if you want to go buy them. Who wants to buy one? Well, we'll pray for you, mate. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Nobody wants to buy an album of scales. Nobody wants to buy practice. Nobody wants to buy the journey of trust. They want the end result. And it's the same with our Christian lives. It's the mundane, it's the boring, it's the ordinary. It's day after day, I get up, put my shoes on, put my clothes on. Not in that order. My wife says to me, have you paid the bill yet, honey? Not yet, sorry, darling. I'm going to work and I see someone on the way and I stop to pray for them because they're sick. They don't get better, they get worse. And then I catch their sickness. I decide to go deeper in opening my Bible and reading in God's Word. I open my Bible and turn to Leviticus. I close my Bible. I start praying, thinking I will be up for the next two hours, praying and interceding for those I love. I wake up after two hours and I fell asleep after 30 seconds. I start a prayer meeting, thinking that tens of thousands of people are going to turn up. One person shows up. It was my mum. I get home. My wife says, honey, have you paid the bill yet? Not yet, sorry, darling. I then decide to ask a friend to church. And he says, maybe. He doesn't come. He ends up going further from Jesus. And I get so discouraged and I feel so alone. And the devil says in my mind, you should give up. But do you know what? I keep walking and I keep going. And as I start going and I wake up, I see someone that needs Jesus and I pray for them and they receive healing over their pinky toe. And I'll, I'll take it. I then go to the prayer meeting and two people turn up. My dad turns up as well. But then someone random comes into the prayer meeting and they receive Jesus as Lord of their life. I then, that person I was inviting to church, he invites his friends to come and they both give their lives to Jesus. I end up being able to pray for them and they bring their families along and they give their lives to Jesus. I open my Bible and I turn to Psalms and it speaks to my soul. I then start praying and I pray for a minute and I just know that God is moving in people's hearts. And then my wife said, did you pay the bill? I paid the bill for my wife. And then I start realising that even the most minor melodies turn into this beautiful song on my life. I start praying for people. I'm seeing people receive healing. I'm seeing people receive salvation and come to know Jesus and go deeper and discipleship. And I've realised that actually when the devil wants us to give up, God is just saying, I'm just starting. And the most beautiful melody comes from our lives. Isn't that beautiful? Thank you, Vi. And I wanna say today, don't give up because God hasn't given up on you. He loves you so much and He is making a beautiful melody of your life. And I've realised in the midst of the pain, the most painful times in my life where the devil has said, what do you think you're doing? I look at the devil and I say, do you know who I am? Do you know who my dad is? Because my heavenly dad has got my back. And He's got your back too. He loves you. And I wanna say whether you are the oldest son or the youngest son, God has His arms wide open and He's inviting you to trust. There's a beautiful picture that I keep getting over and over of uh, one of my friends that I've been longing to come to know Jesus. And it's been the last seven years actually where I was praying for them. And it was the son of someone here and they were saying he's not in a good way. And I saw him walking about seven years ago. And as he was uh, walking along the street, I just stopped and I, uh, he knew me and I knew him. So I invited him into my car and I gave him a lolly, which sounds weird apart from if you know me, it's not. And, um, and then I, got, I just said to him, is it okay if I pray for you? And he said, oh no, I'm not really into that kind of stuff. 
And I said, that's fine, that's fine. I just, I know that even when you don't believe in Jesus, He still believes in you. And so he started walking and I thought the next day something might change. The next day I saw him and he was in a worse place than before. And I started just thinking, okay, I'm just gonna pray even more. And years went by, I kept seeing him and I, I, my heart would break. He, was, he would uh, be on drugs and just homeless and all these different things. And sometimes I'd stop, other times I felt not to, but I was like, Lord, do you not see him? And I felt God say, just remember, I care more than you. And I just felt in so much pain. And in fact, there was one day a few years ago where I just gave up and I, just, I, was, I, I felt to pray for him every day for the last six years. And I just gave up, I said, God, what's the point? And I felt God say, don't you give up because I'm not gonna give up on him. And I got this picture of me waiting at the gate with God. And as I was waiting at the gate with God, God turns to me and says, would you wait with me? And I said, yeah. And it's my greatest privilege to say three weeks ago, this guy turns up at this church and I couldn't believe my eyes. And he gives me the biggest hug. And he says, I had this radical encounter with Jesus just by myself. And I went to a church this morning and gave my life to God. But the church isn't on tonight and I'm so hungry for Jesus. So I just decided to come here as well. And I, I was just so overwhelmed and I started crying with him. I said, every day I've been praying for you. And last week, last Sunday, he got baptised. And I felt God say to me, Aren't you glad you didn't give up? Aren't you glad that you just kept trusting me, even when it hurts so much? And I wanna say to you today, God has not given up. He's not given up on the people you love the most. He's not given up on the dreams of your heart. You can trust Him, but He's just invited you to trust Him afresh today. Inviting you to say, okay, God, I trust you. And I'm gonna start, start, stop where I started that, Remember, He has decided you far before you decided Him. In fact, the greatest testimony for our lives of not giving up is that Jesus didn't give up on me. When I was that older son, He kept running out to me with His arms wide open. 